Greetings and welcome. I'm Karen Simpson, the co-executive director of the Southeastern National Tuberculosis Center. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Trauma-Informed Care, Caring for Ourselves While We Care for Others. This webinar is being hosted by SNTC as part of the NTCA and Centers of Excellence Nurse Education Series collaboration. You are in for a treat today. Our speaker is Debbie Sestera Seifer. Debbie's a nurse specialist and a clinical trainer with the North Florida AIDS Education and Training Center. She's worked primarily on the Practice Transformation Project, for which she, she provides frequent trainings on HIV and chronic disease management, team building, motivational interviewing, behavioral health, cultural humility, stress management, sexual health, medication adherence, trauma-informed care, and patient experience. Debbie formerly held the position of project coordinator for the Florida Caribbean Telehealth Education and Training Center and was also coordinator of the expanded HIV testing initiative for the state of Florida. Debbie's work history also includes nine years in the Virgin Islands, working as an assistant professor of nursing with a focus on mental and behavioral health and HIV treatment and care. Debbie is passionate about working with diverse populations and confronting social determinants of health. She is a nationally certified nurse coach, a certified trauma professional, and a national quality improvement leader with the Center of Quality Improvement and Innovation. Thank you, Debbie, for joining us today. I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Karen, and uh, the team that is supporting me and uh, in the background. I appreciate you and, and welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, it's great to be here. And I hope that uh, throughout this program, you will find a moment to pause and, and uh, think about some of the things that have been going on in your professional and your personal life as we discuss trauma-informed care, caring for ourselves, while we care for others. I do need to let you know that uh, the activity planners and myself do not have any financial relationships with commercial entities to disclose. Uh, I will not be discussing any off-label use or investigational products during the course of this program. And I want you to know that the slide set has been peer reviewed to ensure that there are no conflicts of interest represented in my presentation. I have some lofty objectives and I, if we get through them all, I think we're really doing well. Uh, I'll call it a very good day. I know I'm touching on all of these objectives. We're gonna discuss, we're gonna identify, we're gonna operationalize. We're going to identify critical insights about trauma and the principles of trauma. And we're going to describe and discuss the process and the impact, what happens to nurses as we care for others who are impacted by trauma. And that's that vicarious trauma. So we're going to start in a place of calm. And I know how it is when you're rushing between uh, either your patients or maybe Zoom meetings or presentations. You're, and we are in that realm of rushing. Our heart's beating faster, our breath is not as relaxed as it could be. We're not as efficient with our use of oxygen. So I'm going to provide you with several grounding interventions today. And these are an amazing way to bring yourself to a place of calm. And also, I introduce this with my patients as I work with individuals who I notice need a pause. They need to take a station break. So if you will, engage with me in a grounding intervention that starts with a breath. And it starts with taking a very deep breath in through your nose. And when you hit the top of that breath, holding it just ever so slightly and then releasing it through your pursed lips. And continue some sort of rhythm that feels right for you. A breathing in through your nostrils and an exhalation it really lets out a lot of bad air, as I tell people, so that you can bring better air inside. And as you breathe and find your rhythm, I'd like you to make sure that your feet, both feet, 
or touching the ground. This is really how you ground yourself. If our feet are up or crossed or hanging in the air, then we're not grounded to the earth and we're not grounded to our chairs. Uh, and there's a sense that we could fall even because we're starting to promote a relaxation. And as you're breathing, I'm hoping that your breathing rate is going to actually get slower and more efficient. And I'm going to add one more thing to this wonderful grounding intervention. And that would be that I want you to take your left hand and I want you to bring it up in front of you. And I want you to grab your left, your right shoulder. So go to the opposite shoulder. And then I want you to take your right hand and I want you to go towards your left shoulder. So essentially, you're holding both of your shoulders with the opposite hands. And this is a type of hug. We're, we're calming ourselves. And if you really want to put a little extra added grounding to it, I want you to move your fingers like up and down and touch yourself with each finger. I call this a butterfly hug. And if you've been with me before on any types of, of programs where I'm using grounding as an intervention, this butterfly hug is very, very, it promotes safety, it promotes calm, and it's actually very fun. And it allows us to know that we can indeed hug ourselves and find a sense of peace and calm in a moment where we may not be feeling so calm. It gives us a break. It gives us the pause. So remember your butterfly hug. And when you find yourself where you need to calm yourself down, try this. Use your hands. Do the butterfly hug. It doesn't matter if anyone else is in the room. They might want to know what you're doing. You're going to mentor someone else in how to find their space and how to find their calm. We all know that stress and performance is really optimal when we're trying to run a race, when we're trying to do our best work. But if we overdo, which is very common these days I'm finding, we start to go off the other side of the curve. And this is really an adaptation uh, protocol that uh, Han Sele put together about stress and performance. There's a connection. If, I'm, if I don't have any stress in my body, if I'm not pumped up a little bit, I'm probably gonna sleep. I'm probably not gonna be very alert and I'm probably not gonna do my best work, whether that be taking a test, caring for a patient, uh, doing my math so I'm ensuring that I'm giving the right dose to the right patient, the right time and the right day. When we hit that optimal level, we're at our very best. But when we overdo and we don't have a chance to pause like we just did, that intervention, we find ourselves sliding off a slippery slope that leads to anxiety, feeling rushed, even disorganized. Even the best of us who are great at uh, you know, multitasking can find ourselves forgetting and going, oh gosh, I should have done that an hour ago because we're feeling disorganized. We're fear, fear, feeling hurried. So let's talk a little bit about that stress. Where is that coming from? Well, there's two types of stress. There's the routine stress of daily living. And then there's the traumatic stress, which we are going to spend a good deal of time about today. Routine stress, if you were going to take a Likert scale from zero being no stress and 10 being extreme stress, routine stress falls in zero to six range. But when you get out of the six and you start moving towards seven to 10 on the continuum of stress, you are going to see more trauma. You're going to see more traumatic injury, as we call it. And in many cases, as we've seen throughout COVID-19, we find people who are feeling not only the trauma of just doing their regular job, 
but we're seeing grief, injury. We're seeing moral injury where we have conflicts because we're witnessing things that just aren't nursing at their best. They're not medicine at their best because we're having to cut corners. We're having to do things quickly and maybe with not everything and all the resources we need. And then fatigue injury, another type of wear and tear injury, which is the accumulation of stress without sufficient rest and without sufficient recovery. So stress indicators help us see where we are on the thermometer of stress. If I'm working with an individual on an anxiety management plan, I'm talking about a thermometer and I'm talking about different levels where there's normal anxiety to get through your day, to be able to persevere and do good work. And then there's that level as it goes up to the four to five, to the six to eight, to the nine to 10 range. I want individuals to find their top of their range and do prevention, to do interventions so that they are not functioning at that get, get help now safety types of level. I want people to know that they're headed that way and intervene on their own behalf. And these indicators I'm talking about could be changes in eating habits, skipping a meal. How many of us forget to drink water, maybe for six or more hours? We are not eating, we, we forego a meal we might even start to see changes in our, our weight. We're losing interest. We might lose interest in our day-to-day -day activities that usually give us uh, a sense of accomplishment. We might feel more fatigued than usual. We might start seeing changes in relationships at work and maybe at home. We might wanna self-isolate. Maybe we find ourselves pulling inward as opposed to being outward and, and looking for support in our different worlds of environment, our home environment, our friend environment, our professional environment. When we start self-isolating, and we've never done that before, that's, a, that's a, 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 a theme and something to take note of. Difficulty getting tasks done, not interested in usual activities, foregoing normal activities. Obviously, it's hard to know what is normal during COVID-19, but it is knowing that you could do something even with wearing a mask and social distancing, but you chose not to, not because it wasn't safe, but because you didn't have the energy. So stress injuries can cause distress. A stress injury is a feeling of extreme worry, sadness, pain that can occur in response to any adversity and it's the emotional distress that often causes us physical and behavioral harm. Feelings that one might have are sorrow, agony, grief, misery, anguish, and just plain upset. These I call stress injuries. Doesn't mean that you have a diagnosable trauma condition, it means that you're having multitude of stress injuries that are chronic and that at some point may play out to be a cause of more extreme distress, which now brings me to the word trauma, which are those experiences that produce intense emotional pain, fear, or distress and possibly, not in all cases, in fact, in most cases, they don't, but in some cases, they have long-term physiological and psychological consequences. Trauma results from exposure to adverse happenings or events, violence, disasters, poverty, neglect, discrimination. There are three types of trauma. There are acute traumatic events, there are chronic traumatic events, and there are complex trauma events. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. The acute trauma results from a single incident, and it occurs most 
immediately. It come, really happens fast after a traumatic event. Let me take something that is benign, not in the work we do. I'll give you an example. I was sleeping one night and unbeknownst to me, a family of bats fell through my chimney. I woke up to very strange sounds. And when I lifted my head from the pillow, two bats came right over my head. Now this is in the dark and all I could see were their eyes and their, their mouths, but it was not an appealing thing to wake up to. And as the evening went on, even when I turned the lights on, these bats were very unhappy. They were traumatized from falling through my chimney. And likewise, I was traumatized to have a family of bats in my bedroom while I'm trying to figure out what to do. So right there and then I can tell you, at one point I ran out of my bedroom and put myself in a closet just so I could calm myself down. That was a traumatic event. And I'm laughing at it now because I survived it, obviously I'm here. But at the moment, I thought I was going to die. I really did. So complex trauma, unlike the bat example, let's talk about Marcus. He grew up in a family that did not accept people who were gay. When Marcus went to school, he was bullied for many, many years. He is currently on PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis to prevent getting HIV. And now we find he's just been let go of his job as a result of the pandemic. He had a service public facing position. Marcus is uncomfortable going to the local testing center for COVID-19, even though he has symptoms and he's not feeling well. Marcus has a history of trauma, numerous events, different types of events. And so for Mike Marcus to go to a testing center and have contact with some sort of clinic that he's not sure what is going to happen there, that could be very traumatizing and fear could bring on fear for Marcus because of this past chronic trauma. He may have been exposed to violence. We don't know. I've given you very little other than using the words trauma and bullied. He may have experienced great stigma, which he may have even internalized it. And we don't know, but maybe he grew up in poverty. We don't know anything more, but I can tell you that Marcus comes from a history of complex trauma. The three E's of trauma that I'd love for you to remember are the event, and that can be a single event or a series of events, the experience, remembering that everyone's experience is different. If I had been a zoologist and the bats had fallen through my chimney, I might have thought, oh, wow, there's some bats in my house. No big deal. I was thinking rabies, and I was thinking they're going to kill me. But that might not be everybody's experience. And then finally, the three E of trauma is affected. Some people will be affected long-term and some were not, and some will not be. As you can see, we have that stress meter, the no stress, mild in the blue zone, which is sort of a nice cool color. And then as we start heading into the yellow and orange, the four, five, six, seven range, you've got moderate stress and then you start to go into the red and the deep red colors, eight, nine, and 10, where we're talking severe stress on Debbie's stress meter. So what are the categories of stress events? Well, abuse, loss, and then there's chronic stress. And take a look at this. I, you can read just with me, but I think the things that I think of right now that are most prevalent and important for our discussion today are the senses of witnessing, witnessing emotional uh, traumas, bullying, emotional distress, any type of abuse, 
witnessing death under loss, death that has not, you weren't prepared for, death that you never thought in a million years would happen. And then of course, the chronic stresses, which I am hearing so much about through many of the uh, individuals I'm working with in many of our uh, Florida communities, which are people unable to get food, food pantries completely barren, and poverty, extreme poverty. So I have a great book that in 1979 won the National Book Award. It was about the Vietnam War. Tim O'Brien is the author, and it's about the things they carried. And often, it wasn't what was just what they carried, their canteen, they carried what in their backpack, what they carried in their pockets, but it was that they carried each other, the wounded and the weak. And as I think about the things that these soldiers carried, like can openers and pocket knives and mosquito repellent, chewing gum, cigarettes, salt tablets, I think about what are we carrying with us? What did the pandemic, how did it affect us? And what do we carry with us? What have you noticed about what you've been carrying with you? Whatever your role in delivering care is, what have you carried? Maybe you have a physical backpack, a, a purse, a knapsack, pockets. Use the chat right now, tell me. What have you been carrying with you when it comes to COVID-19 and doing your work as a nurse out there, face fronting with people? What do you carry with you? Take this moment and I'm seeing, as I'm looking at the chat because I am looking, that people are popping in, let's see. Let's see, there we go. I'm seeing hand sanitizer, absolutely, and masks and distance and shame. Yes, that's that the, our ethical self is being affected. Worry for the future, your rosary, yes. Being a public face, sadness, pain, sometimes having to put on a different face when behind that face, you have a lot of other feelings. Masks, sanitizers, yes, a change of clothes. Can't wear the same clothes all day. And it's not because you're necessarily dirty or sweaty, it's because you don't want to transmit COVID to anyone. Empathy, fear, anger, absolutely. Worry, oh, thank you so much for sharing. Frustration, yes. Confusion, what to do. What kinds of things can we do? Trying to problem solve in the moment. Silence, yes. Not knowing what to say, not knowing what to do. Yes, the role strain. Feelings of being ineffective and inefficient. Too much work. And even speaking up for yourselves, but knowing that everyone else is working just as hard. Hoping to assist others, missing human contact, testing and vaccinating not wanting to expose others' loneliness. Yes, you carry your faith. Absolutely, we carry, we carry our strengths with us. We carry our guilt and our sad feelings about neglecting people in our lives. We're providing care to many people, and sometimes we can't even provide that same care to our family members. Yes, burnout, we're gonna talk about that word. Hope and empathy, again, some more strengths. We're carrying all of this. It's a lot to carry. I'm picturing right now backpacks and purses and knapsacks and pockets just bulging with, with very positive strengths like gratitude and faith, but also with, with feelings of emptiness and fear and isolation. We're perhaps a little unbalanced. Thank you so much for participating in that chat. So the COVID-19 pandemic, it's had a huge magnitude of, of change. It's, it's caused us to have a lack of control, a powerlessness feeling, 
not knowing what the outcome is or what it will be. Increase in stress and anxiety, it exacerbates any other, say, stress that we had in our lives. We're seeing the loss of friends, family, patients. And, and one of the neurosurgeons in New York, I believe, uh, New York Times put this out, Jeffrey Oppenheim, neurosurgeon, said, working as a neurosurgeon, I've always found it important to contain my emotions, like in a vessel, right? He's talking about containing his emotions. These last two months, I've cried more than I have in decades. Allowing myself that vulnerability has been cathartic. This is a great learning moment from Dr. Oppenheim because by containing, we are building that pressure, that intervention that we did earlier in the program at the beginning of this session. We've lost that just talking about all of these very, very stressful conditions that we've been working under, even with our strengths there to pull us up and pull us along. It's stressful just talking about it. And here's where I want to bring up that welcoming of self-compassion. This is a key in our self-care. It's a word that I want everyone to become very, very familiar with. What is self-compassion? It's the life-changing perspective of showing kindness to ourselves in all situations. The kindness that I'll remind you that you show your colleagues, your family, whether they're family that you've adopted, whether they're blood relations, your children, your pets, we show compassion, especially as healers, as we are, we show much compassion to others. But unfortunately, we may not be so good at self-compassion where we become our own best friend. Think of self-compassion as a supportive best friend that lives inside of each and every one of us that can be accessed at any time and every day. And more than any time before we are engulfed in a sea of challenging emotions, good ones, because we, we do celebrate, I think, many of the things that we've accomplished but we also have to balance that with the fear, the loss, the anger, and the disappointment. I'll bring that word up, disappointment. One way of navigating these unpleasant and imbalanced feelings is to create for ourselves a cocoon of self-compassion. The three components of self-compassion are a decision. You have to decide that you're going to be kind to yourselves. And sometimes you got to sort of poke yourself a little bit and say, you know what? I'm not being so kind to myself. I didn't drink water for four hours, right? That's not being kind to yourself. The second thing or second component of self-compassion is a mindful awareness that when we are in pain or we are having a feeling or an emotion that is hard to digest or observe, absorb, that we can seek some sort of re relief, that we don't have to contain it, but that we can do something with it. We can recognize it, we can name it. And then thirdly, the component of a sense of common humanity or connectiveness, that we are not alone in this, that, that sense of support, that other people are feeling this way. I can guarantee us that. And if you are not familiar with Kristen Neff, she's a professor of educational uh, psychology, the University of Texas. And she co-authored the book, The Mindful Self-Compassion Workbook. And I can highly recommend that if you're looking for ways to build your self-compassion muscles. I'm talking about the fact that we're wounded healers and oftentimes wounded healers give more than they can give themselves. And knowing that, that our individual suffering is reflected by a collective suffering. All of us on this call today have had some suffering this past year in our lifetimes. And there will be more suffering, no doubt, coming forward on any level. We don't know when, we don't know how. 
And there may be chronic suffering caused by the pandemic because at this point we don't know, we don't have a good sense of if, whether there'll be a finite end. It's liberating and healing to step out of that sense of fear and anger and frustration and disappointment and reframe it as we're all feeling this. This is something we can all work on together, a sense of humanity. So let's go back to another grounding intervention because if you're like me, you're already feeling yourself rev up a little bit because we're talking about things that are hard, that are difficult. So I want you to work on your breath, ground those feet, two feet, both touching the floor. And I want you to take a very nice deep breath in through your nose. And when you get to the top of that breath, I want you to let it out easily, gently, and for the longest period of time you can. And enjoy how that feels. And when you think about taking that next breath, I want you to do something different on the exhale. I want you to do an audible sigh. So as you take your deep breath in through your nose, top of the breath, and I want you to sigh. Ah. Don't worry if you're in a room with other people, it'll actually sound really fun and good. I call this yummy. Letting it out with an audible sigh. Ah. Or whatever your sigh sounds like. There's no right sigh. There's no wrong sigh. It's about your sigh. And repeat this a few times. What you are doing is you are activating your parasympathetic nervous system. You are resetting your body. You are using an innate mechanism that you have inside of you to create a, a, a calmness. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. So keep breathing and try to get to that sense of evenness. And if you, if you didn't get so attached to that technique of an audible sigh, read these words with me. Light before me, behind me, at my left, at my right. Light above me, below me, in me, to my surroundings, to all, to the universe. What this does is it creates space and it creates a place of calm, letting you know that you're safe and that there's light all over, even if you can't see it. In a dark moment, there's still light all around you because we each exude light. And again, I'm gonna bring it to your attention about this nervous system of ours tapping our natural place of calm. The nervous system has two parts, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. To the right of your slide, you see the sympathetic. The sympathetic nervous system increases the heart rate. It gets us going. It gets us ready, prepared to take a test, to do a procedure, to welcome someone to care that we are newly caring for. The parasympathetic nervous system decreases the heart rate. It decreases our breathing rate. And it is, think of it as the brake. It puts a brake on the rising stress, the rising heart rate, the rising respiratory rate. It helps break. It helps you take that pause. It allows you to feel safe. It allows you to be open to caring to bonding with others, and to connectedness. You can't do that when your sympathetic nervous system is activated. You're too busy just doing what you need to do. Your focus is on a task. It's on an outcome. So here's a good time to bring up the universal trauma precautions that every organization and every person working in the organization should be aware of. First of all, to assume that all people and connected persons with whom we are working are coping with the effects of trauma 
and to modify the way we provide care accordingly. We have to assume it. We have to assume that everyone has been traumatized in some way or another. We have to recognize how our organization, our program, our agency, our environment, and our practice could potentially act as a trauma trigger. What process, what procedures do we do that might traumatize or re-traumatize a person in our care? And third, recognizing that we may also have experienced trauma ourselves, as well as our colleagues, and that we may be triggered by clients, by our colleagues, by their responses and their behaviors. So in order to be a trauma-informed organization, we have to commit to the universal trauma precautions. Think of it as PPE, but PPE to prevent further traumatization, to help people find their breaks. A trauma-informed organization realizes the impact of trauma and understands the potential paths for recovery, recognizing the signs and symptoms of trauma in clients and staff and other persons that work in the system or connect with the system, and also responds by fully integrating that knowledge about trauma into our policies, our procedures and practices, so that every time we look at a policy, create a policy or protocol, or we review it, which we have to do, we want to look at it to see, is there anything about this policy or protocol that could be traumatizing to our staff or to our patients? And then finally, the fourth R of being a trauma-informed uh, trauma-informed organization is to actively resist creating opportunities for re-traumatization. So those are the four R's, if you've ever heard of them, for being a trauma-informed organization. You commit to the four R's. Let's talk about the four R's in terms of physiology. And I'm not going to get really deep into physiology lecture but I am gonna remind you of some of the major structures within the brain that regulate the stress response. The hippocampus, I call it the memory saver. The amygdala, I call that the security guard. Sets off the alarms when we might be in danger. And then the prefrontal cortex, right here in the front of our foreheads, our wise leader, I call that the wise leader. It helps us think, through problems, helps us be very good problem solvers. And nurses absolutely, I think, have very uh, well-developed uh, prefrontal cortexes. So let's learn a little bit more about this system. Well, in order to survive in the world, our instinctive brain overrides the conscious parts and that prefrontal cortex sort, sort of gets uh, a little blurry when we are confronted by something like bats or a saber-toothed tiger in this case. And we have some choices. Our instinctive brain gives us actually five choices. You may be familiar with these three. We can fight the saber-tooth. We can flee or flight. We can take flight from the saber-tooth because we realize we're not gonna beat this thing where we can freeze and maybe the saber tooth tiger will see something else that they want and not us. Maybe it wasn't even about us. We tend to think things are about us, but if we stand very still and freeze, like some of the rabbits that I see do, the saber tooth tiger or whatever the threat may be, may just move right on by. Let's talk about the other two trauma responses that are also instinctive. We have the flop and fawn. If freeze fails, sometimes our autonomic nervous system will switch off to the parasympathetic nervous system. No muscle tone, we're like a rag doll. There's no outward protesting, we're not talking, we're not trying to get our way out of something, we're not talking our way through it. Basically, 
we shut down, our frontal lobe is shut down. And in this case, it might pro provide us with a better chance of surviving by just becoming a rag doll, okay? Maybe even our eyes closed. We're not, we're not we may be even playing like we're sleeping. That's another response. Another response would be the friend response. And this response is when we decide instinctually that it's better to join the, the trauma or the, the instigator, the fearful object, the fearful being, whatever's happening. If we're faced with fear and something, we're worried something is going to attack us in an emotional or physical sense, we may decide to befriend the person or the environment in which we find ourselves. Because if we befriend the individuals or the situation, we might have a better chance of surviving it. And we could probably have many, many examples of this. But I wanted you to realize that there are actually five trauma responses. So our brains are set up to protect, survive, and then to hopefully help us regroup so we can move on. The memories of the traumatic event, though, can get stuck in the body and in the limbic system. The amygdala, that alarm system I was talking about, can get jammed. And some of the memories that we made during this terrible event, like my bad event, can be slightly not complete. So I don't remember all of it because it was such a traumatic event for me. But my alarm system will go off every time I'm reminded of that event. Now, this may happen for 30 days and I might work myself through it where it becomes a past event like it is for me. And I'm telling you about it with, with sometimes even a smile and laughter. But for some people, after those 30 days, a negative feedback cycle starts and it doesn't turn off this broken alarm system that the amygdala has developed. So the individual then becomes overwhelmed by their symptoms of trauma and they can experience triggers. So what are those triggers? Well, the amygdala's alarm system can't tell the difference between a real threat now or the situation or object that reminds them of the previous event. So a lot of this is sensorial. If the door opens suddenly, they can't tell the difference if that's the nice nurse coming in to talk with them or if that's someone to come in to harm them and to cause them great distress. I hope you're following me with this. A lot of these trauma triggers are all about senses, the five senses. It could be a color. It could be an object. It could be the smell. It could be a sound. Have you ever had a patient say to you, what's that sound? What's that sound? In a very quick, concerned, almost a little bit distressed manner. I have before, and that's telling me that they're worried, that there's a concern. So now I need to be on high alert because they may be going into or being triggered. It could be a sensation, a feeling, maybe the way uh, a gown feels on them when they're making a change to putting on a gown that could have ended up in a, a, a terrible triggering event. So in understanding trauma, we have to realize that traumas that we don't even know about do contribute to poor long-term health outcome for many of the people that we work with and for ourselves and our colleagues. Adverse childhood experiences are real. And uh, I, Dr. Vincent Fidelli found this out, Felitti, excuse me. Uh, he ran an obesity clinic in California and he was frustrated when people in his program dropped out even though they were successfully losing weight. He couldn't understand it. The people were dropping out of the program. They were losing weight, which was the purpose of the project. Upon reviewing the histories of these individuals enrolled, he found out that many people had a background 
of many adverse childhood experiences. And he found that weight gain was one way some of the patients who experienced these traumatic events and abusive events had attempted to, uh, to protect themselves. They used food and eating as a way to protect themselves and gain control over feelings of being out of control when they experienced abuse and trauma. So because of this finding, which was by accident, an adverse childhood experience questionnaire was developed. A person's ACE history does affect their adolescent and adult functioning. Persons may struggle with issues related to, I call emotional regulation, or the process of recognizing and managing their feelings or reactions to feelings. And this can come in the form of depression, anxiety, and substance use disorders. Many of you may be familiar with this pyramid, which is the pyramid of showing what happens when someone has childhood experiences as the base of their health pyramid, of their well being. And then it causes disruption in the way the brain is formulated, the neurodevelopment, and then causes social, emotional, and cognitive impairments and goes to into health behavior, maybe risk-taking behaviors, and then finally into disease, chronic disease, and morbidity and mortality. So I use this fear rubric that is just fantastic to help me understand trauma response behaviors. And I wanted to share that with you. It's a model used to better understand trauma and easily helps you remember. It's a mnemonic that helps us explain why patients with a trauma history display certain types of behaviors. The mnemonic is fear, which is easy to remember. Fear extinction. Individuals who have trauma histories may have difficulties feeling safe and calm even when the threat is not present. Emotional, E for emotional regulation. Persons may have difficulties controlling their anger, their impulsivity, their anxiety, and their depression. It's not their fault. They don't know how to contain it, control it, because it seems to have a life of its own. It's not what's wrong with this person. It's what's happened to this person. The A in the mnemonic is attentional bias and cognitive distortions. These individuals may see threats in non-threatening events or situations and hold negative views of themselves and people in the world or situations in the world. And then finally, the R in fear is relational dysfunction. Individuals who have trauma histories may struggle with trust and the ability to feel safe in relationships. Trauma responses are, ab, are normal responses to abnormal situations. And you can see here by all these photos that this is, this is an experience, physical and emotional and psychological experience. It affects all parts of person's activities of daily living. It is a normal response to abnormal situations. The initial response to trauma and distress is feeling revved up, fatigued, irritable, hypervigilant. My, my bat story, all about that. For weeks, I was feeling hypervigilant. I would actually duck in a room if I felt like a fan would put, be put on because the movement of air over my head reminded me of the event. Sleep disturbances. These are experiences that one would expect someone to have in their initial response to trauma and distress. Use the chat right now and, and identify for me one symptom or indicator of a true stress disorder. Now I'm talking about diagnosed. What I've been talking about thus far is really symptoms and how stress and distress 
can end up and result in a stress disorder, but what are the symptoms of a stress disorder? Use the chat and, and help me find out what you all think. Anxiety, yes, disorganized. Yes, memory loss, yes, wonderful. Compulsion for eating, loneliness, not interested in usual activities. Yes, a very, a very good symptom, a sign. Stomach pain, yes, many of these symptoms are somatic especially in people who have, have had great numbers of stressors in their life. They may not say, I'm not able to do my normal activities. They may not tell you they feel isolated or lonely. They may tell you that they've got headaches and stomach problems or diarrhea. Yes. So there's a multitude of things, weight gain, appetite changes, inability to concentrate and to focus. Oh, wonderful. This is a great group. Thank you. Keep, keep it coming. Wanting to do things for ourselves, but can't seem to leave work or stress behind. Yes. Drinking. Yes. We're going to find ways of he healing ourselves, of, of masking these terrible feelings that we're having. So the signs and indicators of a stress response or disorder are definitely hyperarousal, avoidance, intrusive thoughts or memories. Withdrawal from friends and families, anxiety, depression, substance use, everything you mentioned, you all did a better job than my slide. That's how awesome this group is. Nightmares, yes, panic attacks, insomnia. How hard is it for people to fall asleep? A person might not tell you they're depressed, lonely, fearful, anxious, have stomach pains, but they might tell you that they're having trouble sleeping. That could be the sign. So if you want to know all the different diagnoses for trauma, there are many. I've just here indicated post-traumatic stress disorder, which is very well known in terms of PTSD. We say it all the time. Uh, we use it in conversation, not necessarily diagnosing anyone, but just using it because it, it represents the utmost and the ultimate in trauma and stress. Yes, executive dysfunction, suicidal ideation, marital problems. Awesome, I'm still watching, you all are, are, are amazing. So for PTSD, it, according to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders or the DSM-5, you have to have positive uh, symptoms in criterion A, B, C, D, and E. And you have to meet these. And it can't, these symptoms cannot be explained by medication, substance use, or other illnesses. So it's really important that we have the right people to make these diagnoses when we are very concerned that someone is past the 30-day period and is uh, absolutely showing signs of serious distress. Nail biting, I just saw that. Constant physical attention, excellent. The prevalence of trauma and stress-related illnesses in the general population, 60% of adults experience abuse and other types of trauma during childhood. LGBTQ youth have a higher likelihood of experiencing childhood adversity and trauma. Think of our case study there the earlier with Marcus and individuals who are homeless experience more trauma historically and ongoing. Culture and trauma. Our Black and Latinx MSM and transgender persons in our, in our, in our world, in our communities are exposed to a disproportionate high rates of trauma, ranging anywhere from verbal harassment to physical violence, including sexual assault. First Americans and other cultural groups experience historical trauma. The prevalence of trauma is very large. And the WHO uh, did a survey in 2017, the World Health Organization. They looked at 68,894 people. They interviewed all those people. This was pre-COVID, mind you. 
and they came up with seven trauma categories from the people that they interviewed. And I'm not going to go through all of them. I would need you all for several days in a, in a you know, symposium to go over all of this. But I want to bring your attention to number five on the list, unexpected or traumatic death of a loved one. Because I think that that relates very much with what we're experiencing or one aspect that we're experiencing in COVID-19. The study results showed that the unexpected death of a loved one, this is pre-COVID now, it was reported by 31.4% of the respondents and direct risk exposure to witnessing or discovering someone who had died or had serious injury was reported by 23.7% of the persons that were interviewed for this very large study. And on the right of your screen, you're seeing the number of traumatic occurrences that occurred among the respondents. Look at how many people fall into the category of one, two, three, four, five. And the more you have, the more detrimental this is to your health and well being. But imagine what would happen if we were to do this study now following what we know we've experienced with COVID 19 the unexpected death of a loved one, I would suspect that it would be a much higher percent. Remember, this was globally as well. And this is a global experience we're having. This is not only a community experience, it is a global experience. We found that the sociodemographic predictors of trauma in this study uh, and in other studies have shown that women are much more likely than men to be exposed to intimate partner sexual violence, but please don't disregard. Men are exposed to sexual violence and we often forget um, our men are transgender persons who, who really um, have uh, serious uh, trauma histories as it relates to intimate partner violence. And the age of occurrence, the earlier these terrible events have occurred, the more threatening they are to someone's well-being and ability to function going forward. Accidents, unexpected deaths of loved ones and other traumas have later median of age occurrence, meaning in this study, the age group of 24 to 31 were most likely to have these experiences of unexpected death of loved ones and other traumas. The important finding here is that persons reporting traumas involving physical violence. We heard a lot more about physical violence happening during COVID than probably I have recalled in many years. The, when someone reports a trauma involving physical violence, this means that when they have another trauma that reoccurs, that is related to physical violence, that they have a much higher risk for PTSD. So we can see where this could be very important information in working with many of the individuals that we see in our clinics, uh, our homeless population, uh, the, the people that um, don't have access to the, all the types of care that we wish they did and that we work diligently in getting and trying to get for them. The presence of traumatic symptoms during COVID-19. They did a study in Wuhan, China. They gave uh, the 285 individuals with slightly more females than males in this study. They, they administered the PTSD checklist for the DSM-5 and they conducted or administered the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. And what they found in this study was that nearly one in 10 people or 7%, and this was early in the pandemic, reported post-traumatic stress symptoms. We're not diagnosing anyone here, we're just saying they have the symptoms. The prevalence was higher, slightly higher in women in the domains of re-experiencing and negative alterations in cognition and mood and hyperarousal, which were some of the things that you mentioned in your chat. The subjective sleep quality correlated the higher the number of uh, stress symptoms reported, 
the worse the sleep, which is just a negative feedback cycle. Because if you're not sleeping well and you're having more and more of these symptoms, it's hard to break that cycle. I was curious about the mean duration of trauma symptoms. What is the average? How long do people have to, to live with trauma before they can get relief? The average was approximately six years across all traumas. This blew me away and I'm not using tongue in cheek because here on this, I have a, a category five hurricane looking at us, which again is a traumatic event. There was a high of over 13 years for individuals that were involved in combat and war and their traumatic events and a low of about one year for traumas involving exposures to natural disasters, such as category five hurricanes. I also wanted to prepare for you some information about the prevalence of trauma in persons with TB and HIV, those individuals that we call co-infected, which we have found out that the high rates of co-infection are often linked with mental health issues, which involve post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms, which is further associated with poor health outcomes for these individuals. The factors that predicted PTSD symptoms, again, not necessarily the diagnosis yet, but the symptoms were poverty, residing in an urban area, psychological distress, suicide attempts, uh, alcohol, unprotected sex, and then of course the co-infection. So this is, you will all have these slides if you don't have them already. The trauma, healthcare access and health outcomes. The story here is that trauma negatively influences abilities, a person's ability to access care. The care may be readily available, but they can't access it because of their trauma because of this history. They avoid, they, they don't adhere because it's part of the symptomology. They postpone healthcare services and they may misuse medical treatment services. Instead of coming to the clinic, they may be going to the emergency room, but maybe there they feel safer because they don't have to develop a relationship because maybe the crux of their trauma is related to distrust. I, I don't know, I'm just surmising in my experiences. The integration of psychological and TV services has been recommended in the literature. I have a study here that, that brings that to light, that they believe it might improve TB outcomes and progress towards TB elimination globally if we integrated psychological and I believe trauma-informed care into the actual delivery of TB care and treatment. So we know that the self-destructive behaviors occur when someone has been activated by traumas and is suffering, truly suffering with post-traumatic stress disorder. A person commits suicide every 11.9 minutes, not always related to post-traumatic stress disorder, but I'm just putting it out there. And I can't talk about this without giving you the National Suicide Prevention Resource Lines, as well as the National Resources for People Experiencing Trauma. It's really important, or uh, violence, it's really, really important that we have these in our desk drawer, that we have them, these on our phone, because you never know. I have always been surprised. I will run into people who need this help. And by me having it on my phone, in addition to one other thing, like a person I know that can help this individual, it's really important to be able to give out this information. I have given out to students. You never know where someone will disclose to you that they're in trouble, that they're suffering. Thank you so much, Donna, for putting those up there. Trauma-informed care is a strength-based approach to the delivery of healthcare services. It's a program, organizational way of delivering services. It assumes that all people, even the people that work in the program, have experienced trauma. It seeks to avoid re-traumatization. It creates opportunities for patients to tell 
their stories and feel safe. And it teaches and promotes self-care, which we've talked a little bit about today. If you want to develop and adopt a trauma-informed approach to care, there are many resources and SAMHSA is one of the best. They have established the four R's of trauma-informed care, realizing, recognizing, responding, and resisting. You can't get enough of those four R's. So what's the first and most important trauma-informed practice? If you are going to become trauma-informed, what would be in your mind, and here's a polling question we're gonna pull out. What's the first and most important trauma-informed practice? And if, there we go, thank you. Could it be relaxation? Could it be safety? Could it be breathing? Could it be management? What is the first and most important trauma-informed care practices? Go ahead and vie in, what do you think? Debbie, I'm not sure if you can see this, but about 32% have responded. Okay. Um, a majority are saying safety, but uh, not too far behind is breathing. Okay. Um, well, because and I think we... we'll close that and let you go on. Thank you so much, Donna. And that was very helpful. I like breathing too, but safety first, then breathe. <laughs> or breathe and do safety at the same time. Safety. Oh, and now I can see the results. Thank you so much. Trustworthiness, mm -hmm. transparency, peer support, collaboration, mutuality, meaning that everyone, not, it's not just the care providers providing trauma-informed care to our patients. It's not just about them versus us. This is a we. This is a we practice. We all have to practice that amongst ourselves because we work with people who have experienced trauma. We may have experienced trauma. It's about empowerment, voice, and choice. And it's about cultural, historical, and gender issues. So what is re-traumatization? Well, it's a situation, an attitude, or an interaction that replicates events or dynamics of traumatic events that have occurred to a person. They may or may not be obvious to us, to someone just in the room or looking at the waiting room. I might not be able to tell, but, and it's very unintentional. These policies and procedures, we're thinking about being, you know, helpful. We're trying to get all the information we can so we can deliver good care, but maybe we can do it differently because re-traumatization is always hurtful. I've heard uh, many clients, patients tell me, that their clinical encounters were traumatizing. I don't want anyone touching me like they do. I'm not going back there. I didn't like how that nurse looked at me right in the eye like that. I put my hand on this person's shoulder and they jumped back and looked ready to fight. What did I do wrong? I'm not getting put to sleep for a test. A lot of, a lot of patients will tell me, you know, you, can, you know what they'll do to me when they do that. If they put me to sleep, I, I can't protect myself. So organization can trigger re-traumatization as well, meaning that we have to retell our stories over and over again about how we were transmitted, maybe how our HIV, how we became positive. We have to talk about that over and over again. Maybe we're being treated like a number, depending on where we are and what clinic we're going to. Maybe we have to disrobe and that's just assumed, but not a choice. Maybe we're being labeled like, gosh, that person's acting odd, as opposed to what's happened for that person. And maybe we're not giving enough choices. Safety first, ask, ask permission, acknowledge, and just practice trustworthiness. Starting conversations, saying this was a terrible thing that happened to you. You are not responsible. I'd like to help you find someone to talk to so you can trust, someone that you can trust to help you figure out what to do so you can feel better. What do you think of this idea? And what ideas do you have? Again, choice. So here's a polling question. You just started working with a new patient who requires treatment for active TB. 
The patient tells you that her father, mother, and uncle all died from COVID-19 in 2020. You too, the nurse, has experienced a personal family death due to COVID-19. How should you respond? Would you tell the, the patient that you can relate since you've also lost a family member to COVID? Would you normalize the patient's grief? Would you ask the patient about other losses they've experienced such as a job loss? Or would you acknowledge the patient's loss and offer to introduce her or them to a grief counselor or therapist? What would you Be do? Aware you can have multiple answers, so select yep. what you think apply. Absolutely, thank you, Donna. And let's see what you're all it thinking. Is of an essence, so I'm going yeah. to um, end this so you can see some answers here. Yeah, some early answers. That's just great. And I can't see them yet, but there we go. I can see them. Okay, telling the patient um, that you can relate since you've lost a family member, um, normalizing the patient grief, and asking the patient about other losses. I am going to really put this one out to you that the best answer here is that when you notice an emotion that someone has just experienced loss, they have to be grieving. At some level, they have to be. So my best advice would be to normalize their grief. And I use the mnemonic nurse, N for naming it, U for understanding, R for respecting, showing my respect, S for supporting, and E for exploring. Exploring what could we do together and that I want to help and that I know people that, that, that have experience in working in this area. I would not, however, share my losses because then we have a situation where the patient now is sad about us. And we don't want them worrying about us. It's all about them in this moment. We have our, our support and our organizational ways of finding support for ourselves, our personal ways. But in this moment, it's about the client and recognizing their needs and letting them know using the nurse mnemonic, again, name it, the emotion that they're experiencing, understand it, show your understanding, respect it, support it, and finally, explore it. What could we do? I'm curious. How can you feel better? And being cultural, using all of your cultural tools to bring the cultural strengths that a person has to light, but letting them know that, that you're there to help and assist and to learn about their culture and how their culture addresses loss, serious and profound loss. Calm, contain, care and cope. These are the four C's of providing trauma-informed care. Trauma-specific care is different than trauma-informed care. Trauma-specific care is someone who is trained in providing trauma therapy to someone who has a diagnosis of trauma. So we are not in the business of providing that. We are in the business of providing trauma-informed care and referring and introducing, doing warm handoffs to individuals who can provide that therapy, who can provide that type of care. So we want to stay in our lane. It would not be a good idea for us to ask the client, well, tell me about how your mother died or tell me about these losses. Did it all happen at one time? I'm curious. That would be the absolute uh, most, you know, difficult kind of thing to say to a client because you, you are traumatizing them to the nth degree and we don't have the tools to contain that information and to know how to help them. So support is important. Caring for others while we care for ourselves. Many traumatized healthcare professionals have a strong and unconscious uncon tendency to go inward. We, we think we can just hold on and put all our feelings in a receptacle, but eventually they do come out and sometimes not in the ways we would like them to. So it's important to give yourself permission through self-care to I acknowledge your feelings, whatever they are, because that is about stress 
and compassion, fatigue and burnout, the cost of caring for others in emotional pain creates stress. And that stress can become chronic when I'm seeing on the chat here that you're not getting a break, when we're not getting that time for self-care and we're worried about other things in our life. Burnout is the slow depletion of our mental and physical resources. And it's chronic stress without any relief. So stress is chronic and burnout is what happens at the end of a series of, of stressors that keep piling up that we can't do anything about or that we don't actively do something about. And then finally, compassion fatigue, which really refers to the emotional and physical upheaval that occurs when a person is unable to refuel and regenerate. And I don't mean water. I mean, be able to name your feelings, name what you're feeling and, and not be judgmental about it. It's not your fault. These things are happening because this is a pandemic and we are new to what to do in a pandemic. Chronic stress leads to burnout. One third of nurses have high burnout rates and 45% of healthcare workers get less than seven hours of sleep per night. And I'm telling you, all the literature says that is way not enough. Secondary or vicarious trauma is a state of tension and preoccupation with the stories, the distress, and the trauma experiences that we're witnessing and our family members are sharing with us and our friends and our colleagues. And the number of patients that are dying amid the surges, the surges, I will say, is causing us nurses to feel powerless, which can lead to symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder and possibly post-traumatic stress disorder, the diagnosis. So if you're feeling triggered, if we have a brain, and I know all of you do, because you're really good at chatting, it makes us all vulnerable to vicarious and secondary trauma. No one is wearing a cape in this session that is is not vulnerable. There's no protection, there's no shield. We are not immune to trauma, but we, we can promote resiliency where we get our balance, where we take these hard things and stressors and we take those strengths that we have and we balance them out so that the scale tips towards the strong, the strength, the, the good, the good things and the hopefulness that many of you shared on the chat so that the stressors and the hard things aren't as hard. Post-traumatic growth theory is now a very big part of positive psychology. And I've put some information about it here, but we know that for a fact, we're seeing people do more than survive a trauma and they do more than recover and get back to their pre-trauma level of development or level of functioning, they go past many people and they develop post-traumatic growth, which allows the individual to thrive and flourish in ways that they had never experienced before the trauma. And I see this so much. So there is a very hopeful way of looking at resiliency and the power that comes with a balance. So my next polling question is for several weeks, Marcus is a coworker and he's appeared sad and discouraged at work and he's behaved cynically and he's demonstrated less compassion with his patients than you normally see. You do which of the following? Do you do nothing? Do you immediately share your observations with your supervisor? Do you tell another coworker that you think Marcus is burned out? Or do you use what I call the cup of coffee technique to talk to Marcus about your observations and concerns for his well being? What do you think? D, I'm seeing some people putting in the chat. Okay. And I think that because you all are just really pacing with me on this in this program, that D is, uh, and look at that. Oh, high flying colors. And don't worry, the other ones are not like bad things to do, but I would say a first line would be go right to Marcus and talk to him, 
tell them that you're seeing things and you're that you too are concerned. And I've got a little thing that you can do. Ask three questions. I could say to Marcus, Marcus, every day I ask myself if I'm okay. So I want to share that with you. Are you okay? Do you feel you cannot give any more? Do you feel your work is un ineffective? I'm just wondering, because I'm noticing that you're, you're not as engaged in the care, the care that I see you provide usually with so much energy and passion. Again, finding that cup of coffee conversation, self-compassion and, and helping Marcus find out, is he practicing self-care and self-compassion? Is he building his resilience? And this way we stay out of emotions in a non-judgmental way. We talk about building our resilience. Nothing's bad. It's just how can we build our resi resilience and our emotional fitness, if you will. Think of emotional fitness as another muscle in our body. Mindfulness is self-care. We detach from the, the feelings that we're having instead of saying, oh, I could have done better. I'm a bad nurse, or I made a mistake there. I should have done this first before I did that. You don't want to focus on that. Sure, we practice and we do better the next time because we learn. But you want to try to have a sense of self-care that involves mindfulness, where you become aware of these feelings and you move them forward. Mindful awareness is, is holding your hand over your heart and helping yourself work through difficult emotions lets you stay in pain, lets you stay in suffering long enough to make a conscious decision. I'm going to take care of myself. I could blame myself right now for what just happened to this patient. The, the hours and hours I've worked with them in their, their TB treatment, only to find now that they've died from COVID. I'm going to hold my heart and I'm going to feel. Don't, don't push those feelings down. Allow yourself to feel those feelings. Name them. You don't have to be judgmental about them. If you're feeling them, they're valid. They're real. And I'm now going to look to a very good group of scholars in sharing this important video with you about feelings. I get really mad when my brother hits me a lot. I don't like it when you say you don't want to play with me. When I'm mad, my brain can get a headache and it can start hurting. Your blood keeps pumping because you're like really mad. And you start to get sweaty because you're getting really, really mad. And then when you start getting really mad, you turn red. When your body can't really control yourself, mad just takes over your body. I just get out of control. It's kind of like if you had a jar and then the jar would be your brain and then you put glitter in the jar and that would be how you would feel. Like. If you shook up the jar and the glitter went everywhere, that would be how your mind looks and it's like spinning around and then you don't have any time to think. And you sometimes punch stuff and people when you don't really mean it. When I get angry, I feel it in my heart. I really don't like when I get angry. The amygdala really reacts, but the prefrontal cortex tries to keep it down. When I like feel like I want to, you know, get really angry and yell, I just like sometimes, you know, like take deep breaths. Like first you find a place where you can be alone, then you find some way to relax and calm down. When I need to calm down, I take deep breaths. I breathe in through my nose. Sometimes I close my eyes or just take deep breaths. It's like it's coming down, it's like not like moving. It's like 
it's slowing down and then it stops. And the heart plumps slow and then it goes into your brain. It's like all the sparkles are at the bottom of your brain. My brain like slows down and then like I feel more calm and then I'm like ready to speak to that, that person. I get really mad when my brother hits me. So we have, I hope that these young people have inspired you. We're not going to do the polling question, but have inspired you. If you don't already have one to have a ritual, to create a ritual that helps you transition from work to home. and that. This transition helps you top your emotional reserves. And if you've had a particularly stressful day acknowledging and discarding any negative thoughts or feelings can help improve your sleep quality. But don't just put them under. Don't push them down. Allow them to float. Let them name them. Because that, as our neurosurgeon friend said, allows you to feel. And, and if you stop feeling, you can't contain it all. Find a strong support network. Reach out to colleagues and supervisors and mental health professionals that you know. Self-care is about building resiliency and wholehearted living. Self-care starts with one breath and another. And if we had a minute, I would take you through another minute, but I want to show you, I'm hoping you have a little corner somewhere where you can go to care for yourself. And in this uh, program, I want to add that there are coaching applications. These are fantastic. They were developed by the Department of Defense, but they are fantastic. They are, they are wonderful for families and for those of you that might want to learn a little bit more about PTA. PTSD coaching and symptoms. And without further ado, I want to thank you. And I, if we have one minute or whatever time we have for questions, I'm on it. Thank you so much, Debbie. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. Uh, if you can stay a little longer and have questions, please do stay with us. Um, just a few reminders. Um, a copy of today's slides are available on our website. We will email you an evaluation within the next two days, and you'll have one week to complete it. Please check the email you used for registration for the evaluation link for uh, this webinar. And your evaluation is really critical in helping us provide valuable feedback to our speaker and to us. So uh, thank you in advance for your feedback. Um, so if there are any questions, I'll turn it back to Karen and Debbie and we can check the Q&A if you'd like to post there. I'm seeing uh, that you're getting some great information from this. I'm so glad and please use this video. It is very powerful. I haven't showed it to one person that hasn't said, oh my gosh, I just felt better watching it. <laughs> I agree, Debbie. Um, I am not seeing any questions in the Q&A at this time. Um, people really are appreciating it. I think they were just, uh, they were just affirmed and um, given some ideas of how they can uh, take this. So um, I did see earlier, one person said it's her brother is involved in that program where the uh, vet, the, um, yep. So she um, shared with the group in the chat, uh, they who can get involved. So yes. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. That's fantastic. And, and I know someone else put in there and I want to just make mention, they said, we are not alone. And I just hope that you come away from this knowing you are not alone and we've all got you.
All right. So, you know, think of my doing a butterfly hug around everybody that entered this virtual training room today. Thank you, Leslie. She says that's Boulder Crest for anyone who is interested and would like to get more information. Um, she shared it there as Boulder Crest. Thank you, Leslie. That's fantastic. I see Julie has a question. Do you want to take that? Okay. I'm not seeing. Oh, there it is. When you name the emotion, is that getting the other person to identify their emotion or is it for the caregiver to name their emotion? I'm speaking about ourselves naming our own emotions. I have used this as a therapeutic intervention with clients that I have developed long lasting, you know, relationships with in time and providing care to, but I particularly would love to see people take away this from this program is to name it for yourself because we have a tendency to push our emotions down, not even naming what they are, just feeling it. Like I'm feeling angry. I'm feeling frustrated. I'm feeling tired. I'm feeling sad. And by naming it in a moment where you can calmly just let that, that, that naming of that emotion sort of play out. And, and I close my eyes and I go, I see it. I, I see the anger. I see my frustration. I feel my sadness. I feel so sad right now. This person that I'm working with, their life is making me feel so sad. Don't hide that feeling from yourself. I'm not saying to say to the patient, you know, gosh, your life is so sad. I'm really saying this is a internal kind of thing. Name it for yourself. This is, I'm feeling sad for this person. And I'm glad that I'm one person that is part of their care. Does that help? Julie, I hope so. You're welcome. Absolutely. Olive, thank you. Yes, please don't hesitate. If you have any questions, uh, even on the slide set, I do have my uh, email address. So please feel free to reach out. Uh, I could do this all day. Thank you so much. And you're, you've just been a wonderful group. Take good care of yourselves. Thank you, Debbie. I think with that, we'll close up for today. On behalf of SNTC and the NTCA and Centers of Excellence Nurse Education Series collaboration, thank you so much, Debbie, and we look forward to the next in this series. Take care. Thank you.